But we have a wonderful, wonderful kickoff today. I first met Tom Martin in 1994 at the Chesterton Conference when it was still being held in Milwaukee. And uh, we, he's been to a great majority of conferences since then. He's missed just a few. And he's spoken at several conferences. The very first uh, talk he gave was, uh, was on Dostoevsky and Chesterton. So it's very fitting that t today we're going to hear about Solzhenitsyn and Chesterton. Uh, and he has uh, been a long time professor of philosophy at the University of Nebraska at Kearney, where he did what I believe is the equivalent of what John Sr. did with the Integrated Humanities Program at the University of Kansas back in the 60s and 70s. By teaching philosophy and wisdom and the love of wisdom and the pursuit of truth, a bunch of his students became Catholic. They go to a public university and many of them came out Catholic priests. <laughs> it's just, it was actually just an astonishing accomplishment. And it was so successful that a couple years ago, the university shut down the philosophy department. <laughs> but he was ready to retire anyway, because if you look at him, he's as old as Moses. <laughs> and looks like Moses, too, so. He, uh, I've just, he's, he's been one of my great longtime friends in the Chesterton world, and uh, the weekend we get to spend together at the conference is just like a spiritual retreat for us uh, together. And, and so, please welcome the great Tom Martin. <laughs> God Almighty. My name is uh, Deacon, Deacon Dr. Tom. DDT. <laughs> so watch out. I don't, don't do well with weeds, even in Colorado or California. <laughs> Chesterton begins what I saw America with a word of advice. Travel narrows the mind. So why would you ever want to be narrow-minded when you travel? Because he's echoing Aristotle that the mind is meant to come to a point because all things aim at the good and everything in Aristotle moves towards the good or seems to aim at the good unless it's corrupted by vice. So when Chesterton narrows his mind, what you'll find is it opens his mind, and his mind is like the light by which you see light itself. Because he sees from the interior recesses of his soul, and so the light that comes out of him is not his light. It's not the mechanical light of the brain that the revolutionist Darwinians are going to give you. But out of this light that comes out of him, when he looks at something, it's like a prism. And the light hits the prism, and the distortions into six different hues and things that he sees and the layers of meaning. He goes to the literal, the allegorical, the moral, and the anagogical and gives you a spiritual vision when you look into him. So when you see a point and you're on target, it's going to just splatter before you and you look up and at the end of the day you read the page and you go, what happened? <laughs> His first chapter is, what is America? It's a philosophical question takes you right back to Plato. It takes you right back to what is justice. The American founding fathers were liberal artists. They're schooled in the classics. We read their books, every one of them, are looking back. They know that man is a misshapen monster. And I got to read that quote because it's just too good. Everybody realized the only way to go forward is to go back. Man is a misshapen monster with his feet set forward and his face turned back. He can make the future 
luxuriant and gigantic so long as he is thinking about the past. When he tries to think about the future itself, his mind is diminished to a pinpoint with imbecility, which some call nirvana. Tomorrow is the Gorgon. A man must see it mirrored only through the shining seal of yesterday. And that's what our forefathers do. The first question, what is America? It's a philosophical question. It is Plato's Republic, what is justice? Because they're gonna make a republic right now that's never been made out of thought. Idealism, they're gonna make a nation that has never been out of their minds. And you remember the beginning of Republic when Socrates takes this young group of men, he's walking down to the Piraeus on his way back to Athens, which is the seat of wisdom, and he's going up the path, and he hits right there, and Glaucon's servant, no, it's Adimantus, no, it's Polymarchus, his servant holds him back and says, wait, Socrates, we want to talk to you. And he says, well, we want you to come to this party tonight for this god Bendis is down here, for this false goddess, we want you to come and worship with her. And he said, what if I won't listen? I've got to get back to Athens with Glaucon. He said, we won't listen to you, we'll stop up our ears. You must come with us and their friends. So come over to the house. They go to Cephalus' house, and Socrates is there, and old Cephalus comes out. And he says, Cephalus says, happy am I to see you. He's an old man, older than I am. No, not probably. I'm older than he is. <laughs> he can't walk. He can't go to Athens anymore. He says, I'd so love to see you and converse with you, because at my age, my body is gone, so I'd love to have conversation. And Socrates says, I, too, love to converse with the aged, because you have gone down a path that I, too, might be enjoy and be able to walk down someday if I live that long. So could you tell me what life is like? And he said, I'll tell you, a bunch of us get together, my old friends and I get together at the coffee shop, you know, in Milwaukee, Minnesota, Oshkosh, Nebraska, surprise Nebraska, 56 people. And they sit around, they talk, and they said, they sit around the old guy and say, what's it like? Oh, I lost the pleasures that I can't drink anymore. There's no festivals. I can't drink at all. My relatives want to put me in a nursing home. I'm just every, I won state in 58 and nobody remembers. And, <laughs> and I was once present when someone said, Sophocles, how are you as far as sex go? Can you still make love to a woman? And Sophocles says, quiet man. I'm free to be glad from that mad master. <laughs> just a slave who had made me into a slave by his mastery, this tyranny. And Cephalus said, you know, if these guys were right, they're not because I have not had these problems. Because if one is moderate, age and youth are easy. But if not, they are both onerous. Sex is a mad master. This whole dialogue is to draw them out of the tyranny of erotic love into the love of justice. That's what the Republic is. Father Shaw said, if you haven't read Republic, you've never gone to the university. And you read it. Don't read it like a political treatise. It's a drama, and you're in it. So what is America? You're an American. It's the only nation in the world founded upon a creed. A creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is a universal truth, a Catholic idea. No nation can stand that is contrary to what it means to be human. America has the soul of a church. The creed opens her arms to the world. This is every man who is coming into being in the womb, is or was or ever will be. It is a body, a mystical body that's not yet been baptized. America's creed is set forth dogmatically with theological lucidity, Chesterton says, the Declaration of Independence, perhaps, is the only piece of practical politics that is also a theoretical piece of politics and also great literature. It condemns anarchism and clearly condemns atheism, since it clearly names the creator as the ultimate authority. At the heart of America is the theory of equality, the pure and classical concept that no man must aspire to be anything more than a citizen, and no man shouldn't endure to be anything less. The creed is great literature because America is a romance of storied citizens, a land of immigrants, castoffs, exiles, slaves, yearning to be free. America's a romance, it's your romance, of the citizens who are meant for God, and this, the kingdom of heaven on earth.
nobody remembers that. They look backward, and it's an ideal. This is Chesterton's I pre I progress. The progress, you have to have it fixed on an ideal. It has to be fixed. It's not the progressive nature of everywhere I step, everything is better and better and better because we got all the electronics we need, so every generation is getting better. It's this great, there's two wheels in Chester, an easy way to remember Chester, you have two wheels. You have the wheel we're gonna talk about now in the melting pot and the wheel of fortune is what you got here. The materialist stuff, and the, it's irrational. It's the evolutionary wheel and you're in a wheel of fortune and the spring of your life you're growing, you go up into the summer, into the fall, into winter and you roll under, the whole world runs over you twice or three times and then you become sediment and then you become fossilized and then pretty soon somebody will dig you up and tell you where you came from. That's materialism. Progress is province without God. Work on that a while and get back to me. <laughs> my idea is fixed before the foundations of the world. My vision of perfection assured cannot be altered, for it is called Eden. This is America, and I am an American. America is not about individualism. It's about the individual. Chesterton calls it, it's the great American experiment compared to a melting pot. The metaphor implies its pot itself is a certain shape with a certain substance, a solid substance, that there is one pot that must not melt. Or as I always put it, there's one thing that cannot melt, and that's the pot, which is, the, which is different than being potted. <laughs> The original shape is on the lines of Jeffersonian democracy, and it will remain its shape until it becomes shapeless. America invites all men to be citizens, and it's exclusively religious because it's not racial. And we put all these people in this pot, all these immigrants, all these sectarians, and the time when they settled this land and they put us out here, it was a heyday of sectarianism, violence, all these sects, Jefferson writes a letter to Adams, scared to death, the Presbyterians, the Anti-Baptists, the Monrovian Swedes, the Wesleyans, the Quakers, the Curitan, they'll ride up on Mohammed and push all the runs the rest away. So by creating America, they put us all on this level field with the freedoms of the First Amendment where we can have a religion and we're gonna go to the end with our religion and we'll see where we are in the pot. It's says melting pot is where we are, bubbling brew as it were. And the thing that's gonna come out of this is a citizen, no matter who you are, we're not about internationalism. This is not hyphenated America. You can have your customs and stuff, but it's about making an American. When it opens its hands to the world, everyone is invited. I was talking to the desk clerk last night, young man from India, got here from India, and I said, you know why you're here? I came on to be American. You know what the creed is? He didn't know what the creed was. All men are created equal. Nobody's rushing to Mongolia or Mon <laughs> Russia, but anyway. To make the creed even more solid, we gave it a seal. The Great Seal. The Great Seal was created on the day of the Declaration of Independence. They started a committee after signing it. Jefferson, Adams, Franklin were the first committee members. Took them eight years, they made a committee. And their first vision was the three of them had when they saw this is Franklin and Jefferson turned to the Old Testament for inspiration. Franklin selected the moment when Moses causes the water of the Red Sea to overwhelm Pharaoh and his army. And the scene accompanied by the motto, rebellion to tyrants, is disobedience to God. Whew, that was Franklin. Jefferson chose the passage of the Israelites in the wilderness, guided by a divine cloud and a pillar of fire. Okay, Adams, here you go. Looked instead to classic mythology, lit on Hercules. He proposed a scene of the hero pondering the faithful choice between the high road of virtue and the low road of self-indulgence. That's it. There's the road before you, Plato's Republic. You got the Piraeus, go down into the swamp of the seaport or go to Athens, those are your choices. And stand there right there. Every day, every moment in your life, you know it. That's the road you gotta go. Two ways, which one? Robert Frost told you. My fellow citizens, high road or low road. The great circle is a symbol of the alpha and omega of divine liberty and the justice at the heart of the American Revolution, which was a restoration of a new nation for the romance of the citizens with God. A revolution is always a restoration because you have to have an ideal you're going to. You drop the R from revolution and you get 
evolution because you're not trying to restore anything because there's nothing worth living for to restore, even you. Yep. There's those who argue that the founding fathers owned slaves and did not believe what they wrote. Jefferson owned slaves in the darkest state of his simple deism. So the sight of slavery in this country made him tremble, remembering that God was just. This is as it should be. Jefferson, Washington, and other founders realized the condition, their condition of owning slaves before God, who is just. The liberty of their slaves is tied to their own liberty. They know what ideas are. Nevertheless, the abject principle of equality is not self-evident to many. For example, John Randolph of Norfolk, Virginia. In regard to this principle that all men are born, are born and equal, if there is any animal on earth to which it does not apply that is not born free, it is man. He is born most wanting, the state of perfect helplessness and ignorance, a rickety little creature who sees the first light in a workhouse or a brothel, and who feels the effects of alcohol before the effects of vital air, is not equal in any respect to a ruddy offspring, honest yeoman. <clears throat> He's right. In the observations of the material conditions of man, all men are not created equal. You didn't get to choose your parents. You didn't get to choose your race. You didn't get to choose your sex. You didn't get to choose your birthday. You didn't get to choose your height. <laughs> but there's no inequality or equality in nature because there's no moving principle in nature and there's no directive principle in nature. Chesterton said, equality is not some crude fairy tale about men being equally tall or equally tricky, which we, can, we cannot only cannot believe, but cannot believe anybody believing it. Equality is the absolute of morals by which all men have a value invariable and indestructible and a dignity as intangible as death. So let's replay how the idea of democracy works when he arrived on the shores of America. This is the first chapter. He defines America, and he, you gotta read the book. It's, the, it's a heck of a book. Thanks for giving me, Dale. It's all he's about nine, 12 chapters in before he gets to the conclusion, but he gives you these visions, and this is his mind exploding where he goes and that light goes into the prison. What is America? He goes to the question, and then it explodes, and he's gonna go right to narrowing the mind into a meditation on Broadway. Don't you love it? He narrowed his mind, he got the Broadway. And here's what he's gonna really gotta I gotta read this quote, because it's like I can sit down if I get this nailed, because there's <laughs> nothing to say after that. Make sure you start with the right page. Yeah, there. Here, here my, look, he lands in America. Somebody takes him out there. He looks at the lights of Broadway by night. I had looked not without joy with that long kaleidoscope of colored lights arranged in large letters and sprawling trademarks advertising everything from pork to pianos. Through the agency of the two most vivid and most mystical of all the gifts of God, color and fire. I said to myself, in my simplicity, what a glorious garden of wonders. This would be if anybody was lucky enough to be unable to read. <laughs> Here is a parable of sorts. But let us suppose that there does walk down this flaming avenue a peasant, a sort of that scornful and illiterate peasant by those who think that insisting on people reading and writing is the best way to keep them out as spies and who can't read, who read in all languages and forgers who write in all hands. On the principle indeed, a peasant merely acquainted with things of little practical use to mankind, such as plowing, cutting wood, growing vegetables, Rocking a baby would very probably be excluded. The soul of a man such as this would soar high in the skyscrapers and embrace a brotherly love broader than Broadway, realizing that he had arrived on an evening of an excep exceptional festivity worthy to be blazoned with all this burning heraldry. He would please himself by guessing what great proclamation or principle the Republic hung in the sky like a constellation or rippled across the street like a comet. He would be shrewd enough to guess that the three festooned fringes with the fiery words of somewhat similar pattern stood for government of the people, for the people, by the people. 
For it must be obvious that be, unless it were liberty, equality, and fraternity, his shrewdness would perhaps be a little shaken if he knew the triad stood for tang tonic today, tang tonic tomorrow, tang tonic for all times. <laughs> the truth can be seen on a much smaller scale, but for a much larger purpose. Peasants also have ritual and ornament, but it is also to adorn more real things. Apart from our first fancy about the peasant who could not read, there's also doubt about what would be apparent to a peasant who could read, there'd be no doubt, and who could understand. For him, fire is sacred. For him, color is also symbolic. And where he sets up his candle to the light of the shrine of St. Joseph, he finds that 1,200 candles on Broadway lit up to the seventh heaven cigar sign. <laughs> this is the real case of America. Democracy and ideals of America, while it still generates sincerity and sometimes intensity, is another issue and tendency of industrial progress. America is not alone in possessing the industrialism, but she is alone in emphasizing the ideal that strives with industrialism. Industrial capitalism and ideal democracy are everywhere in controversy, 1921. Global economy. That's a vision of what's happened to America right there. That's the vision. You got Broadway and Miss Jerusalem. I found my real innocent peasant abroad. He was a waiter, a Bulgar, a Bulgarian. He was dressed in a costume, because if he's a waiter, you put him in a costume, but you gotta put him in a costume. He was serving him clam chowder or such a thing. I didn't know what to say to him. I'm afraid I don't know much about Bulgaria. I suppose most of your people in agriculture, aren't they? He did not stir an inch from his regular, angular face, but he slightly lowered his voice and said, yes, from the earth we come and to the earth we return. When people get away from that, they are lost. The immigrant. He leaves New York and goes to Boston and his mind explains, his mind moves like this. When he sees one image, he sees another. So he goes and he sees houses as he goes there. And all of a sudden he sees forests of houses. The forests of houses become the wood of the cross. And we, first he goes superstitious. Men used to touch trees because they were holy and sacred. But then he goes away from superstition to the wood of the cross. And then he sees a table with 13 people. And then he goes back into their houses. And he hears this crude joke about how Americans were always kind of backwoods. He said, the real problem is we don't know if they're out of the woods yet. <laughs> we don't know if they're out of the woods yet. And he looks at these houses. I like the Americans. I thought they were very sympathetic, imaginative, and full of fine enthusiasm. And the one thing I could not clearly understand about their future their happiness in their farm homes, their frame houses, having democracy, good education, and the hobby of work. The one doubt I had that did float across me was something like this. Where will this be in 200 years? A serious question. Where will it be in 200 years? 22, 21. He travels across the Midwest to little towns of the vast prairies, which is where you would see the peasants, this idea of their democracy because they have landed plots in their local governments. He sees the Catholic idea. And this is contrasted to the whole work with the industrial idea and, and an agrarian idea. 90% of all people in Jeffersonian American are farmers. All my immigrants were farmers. And all of them lost their land, and it's all agribusiness now, and it's 1%. And corporate America and every other the family farms, sponsors of the first land grant universities got bought up by Monsanto and it's industrialized everything, everything. A thousand head of cattle milked in a metal building three times a day. In his relative, he goes Midwest and he sees it, the farming. He says, wooden houses may come or go, but the farms will last. Farming will always last. In this relatively equality, the Americans of the Midwest are far more advanced than the English of the 20th century. It is not their fault if they are still some centuries behind the English of the 12th century. Remember the, the spirit, the spring? 
the revival, the Franciscan revival of the spring, that's 12th century he goes back to. Chester, I mean, Pierce will help me on this when he gets up here, hopefully. But the defect of following a true peasantry is they do not produce their own spiritual food. They do not, like some peasantry, create their own culture, the same kind as agriculture, but their culture comes from the great cities. He's during Prohibition, they've closed the taverns and they created a cinema. And he'll go on and say, great, they substituted the cinema for the tavern. And now men who used to fight in this wonderful place, the political arena of the, of the tavern has been closed down where they might even come to blows. Now they're all forced to sit in silent. It's all silent movie. So now there's no longer, and the culture you're going to watch is New York City, what you're watching now. Gangster rap is going to be pumped to my little towns of Burwell, to Carney. We're going to listen to gangster rap and teach your kids English, and that's who's going to feed them through the stereo opticon of this machine called electronics, who is another planet unto itself that everybody's wired to. It's your new umbilical cord, and it gives you everything you need to know, and you can't even break from the sucker. It just holds you. Richard Weaver wrote that. That's the called the University of Chicago, 1950. I watch my whole Midwest. I drive through where my ancestors live, and it's all just one Midwest town, ghost town after another, with a dollar general at the end of the dang thing, brand spanking new and lost everything. Everything's gone. One thing about Americans, too, he said they love sports, but they're not sportive. What does he mean by that? They love the excitement and enthusiasm, but they have no sense of the leisure and the love of sports. Now with the new portal system they have for, for the athletic players, each player has no sense of an individual, but they're all individualism. How long does it take to get your hair fixed and your costume and your tads right and your shoes right before you can even step on the court to play with somebody? You gotta look what when you get out there, child? You gotta be the meanest machine on the planet. Because if you don't got your logo and your brand working, but you're moving on next year once you see your stats, you're going where? going to New York and you're going to stub your toe on the fence and we haven't seen you since. But he's a decent man, Judge. <laughs> but that's America. The culture your children have did not come from your home. They don't play cards. They can't play musical instruments. They don't even play sports outside. You go outside, there's nobody playing ball in the fields. And the ball they play, my daughter, after they play ball, they never played another game in their lives after they left high school, especially the girls. You don't see girls playing pickup basketball. Why? Figure it out. Try to make them and chain them to sports. Take them out of the homes, their phenomenony. Try to make them into men. Make them Adidas, Nike. I didn't know what I was going to say today, but I'm sorry. <laughs> the high point, okay, now he, moves, he shifts. I'm doing well. I got finish in two minutes. No, I won't. The highest point of democracy, the Chester, the highest point of democratic idealism and conviction was at the end of the 18th century. The highest point was at the end of the 18th century. Then you move into the 19th century, there was more sympathy for the Negro in the school of Jefferson than in the school of Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederate States. After a century of advancement, Lincoln could no longer appeal to the American creed to free the slaves or even this nation. They didn't fight the war for slavery, Chester says, it was to keep the Union. This is what the Declaration of Independence would read like. We hold these truths to be probably enough for pragmatists <laughs> that all things that look like men evolve somehow being endowed by heredity and environment with no equal rights but very unequal wrongs and so on. <laughs> That's all of Darwinism in a nutshell. Your reflection of your environment. Welcome to the dawn of Darwinism. Everything starts the smell of the monkey house. <laughs> Because now you've got the wheel of fortune, all you mutants out there that have come from nowhere. And Marx, you go to Marxism, it's even better. Man is an animal. The German ideology I'm quoting from. He begins to distinguish himself from the other animals the moment he begins to produce his means of subsistence, a step required by his physical organization. By producing food, man directly produces the material of life himself. Wow. The beginning is an animal, the social life itself, is mere herd consciousness. But at this point, man has only distinguishes himself from sheep by the fact that he's conscious while the sheep is instinctively a sheep. 
That's Mark's. Man is the only one of all the animals who produces. That means all the other animals don't work. But man is the one, his great saving grace, he has to produce. In other words, man is made for work. Work is not made for you to polish yourself and become beautiful in a Chester Academy with a liberal arts education. It's made to work, 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 work. Well, how much money do you make? It's not about the salvation of your soul. We canceled my whole university so we can move to health science. That's where we're in health science now. Chesterton said on health, healthy people don't care about health. <laughs> All your patients are terminal, if you haven't checked out. Every one of them, the doctor. Come on, stop it. They all die, the puppies. Every one of them. Healthcare. Look around you. Planet Fitness, go to Walmart. Do Americans care for health? We're the least healthy people on the planet. Change you can believe in. No, you need a belief that doesn't change. You got it all backwards every time, a progressive Democrat. There's no progress. You've got to go backwards to the saints. All the truth is behind you. You're sticking your head in the Gorgon world, thinking you're going to amount to something. Hey, evolution, nothing matters. Got it? Because everything matters. That's because nothing matters. <sighs> OK. <laughs> progress is province without God. I love it. Men are mindless. They're not allowed to question. Here's a helper for you. I go to just a sociologist. You ever take sociology? Simplest thing in the class. Here is all of sociology in a paragraph by one of its founders, Graham Sumner at Yale University, one of the first sociologists who's right into Mark. Here's all of sociology in a nutshell. From all learning from anthropology and, and ethnography about primitive men and primitive societies, we perceive that the first task of life is to live. I remember doing this when I was, a, I was a veteran and I was sitting in class going, come on, stop, man. Come on. That's it. Men begin with acts, not with thoughts. Need was the first experience and it was followed at once by the blundering effort to satisfy it. It is generally taken for granted that men inherited from their guiding instincts from the beast ancestry and it may be also true, although it has never been proved, need was the impelling force. The ability to distinguish between pain and pleasure was the only psychical force. That's it, in a nutshell. All the sociology, and every people got their own needs, and they got their own cultures, and which one's true? None of them. And we're gonna celebrate our differences. Won't that be fun? <laughs> there is no soul, there's no logos, moved by reason, free will, the grace of God, but a conscious animal responding to urges and stimuli and impulses. This, of course, goes right into other types of things. The revolution, your restoration of man, the symbol of the great creed, you drop the, the R and you get to evolution. Man is in advance over the sheep because he's aware that he isn't a sheep. Is there a religious idea there? You talk about the lost sheep of the 19th century. This will move right into Nietzsche's will to power. And then Freud, with his libido, dominated by sexual repression. His great new erection is that man could only live with an erection. <laughs> Freud. <laughs> the better rejection that you learned was from Sartre. S.A.S. Persepi, popular in the 60s. Got my thing, doing my thing, it's your thing. Yeah, baby, got me thing, down and down the road. Yeah, you got to love the one you're with. Children can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> Whoa, baby. Anyway, on they went. <laughs> S.E. S. Persepi. S.E. Whatever you perceive to be is what is. And wonderfully, the Supreme Court Judge Anthony Kennedy. Wonderful. He argued in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, at the heart of liberty is the right to define one owns concept of existence of the meaning of the universe and the mystery of human life. Each one of you do this for us. You couldn't be any further from creation if you tried. That's codified law in America in defense of abortion. You define the world 
cannot keep its own secular ideas. The order cannot secure. One of its noble and natural concepts of circular perfection, we seem to have lived in the time of the heroic legends of the republic and the citizen, which seemed to Jefferson and the eternal youth of the world has begun to grow old in turn. We cannot recover the earthly estate of knighthood to which all the colors and complications of heraldry seemed as fresh and as natural as flowers. We cannot react the intellectual experience of the humanist for whom Greek grammar was like the song of a bird in spring. The more the matter is considered, the clearer it will seem that those old experiences are not only alive where they have been found a lodgment in the Catholic tradition of Christendom. St. Francis is the only surviving troubadour. St. Thomas More, the only surviving humanist. And St. Louis, the only surviving knight. I read that before, but I thought. <laughs> Chesterton, um, I could go on like this forever, but you get to read that. I mean, it's so important with the Broadway when you get the eyes. But more importantly with all of this is the power of the mind when you read Chesterton, this illumination. When you learn the four levels of interpretation in school, the first is to read the literal, and then to read the allegorical. So you move into the allegory. So you, you see like this, your own life, you see a bird in the morning. I was looking out, praying to Rose the other day on my deck, and I looked out, and it was all gray in Nebraska, great sky gray, and all of a sudden it opened up, and there was this little figure there, sh twisted, and I looked at it, and I said, wow, that's a fetus. That's an that's a embryo. I mean, that's a baby right there. Did he bring any of a baby? And I looked to the to the west end in, the, in Nebraska, the sky, the sun was coming up and the sky was starting to lighten up in blue, blue, blue and beautiful white clouds and I was looking at the inn at the end of the world. Right there on my deck saying a rose and I turned around and it was gone, the gray sky was there and I was left in my thought. That's how the local works. It's by revelation. There's no proof. He comes to you in the moments when you're paying attention. You get up in the morning, you fall on your knees. Have mercy on me, a sinner. May I go forward and decrease so you may increase. Let me be your servant this day. Let me be your servant. I'm no plaything, and I'm no sheep, just instinctual. I'm a sheep, I need to slaughter my life for you, Lord. I gotta be somebody. I was a simple kid, I got the lowest score ever in college on a GRE, because I snuck in the back door in Missouri. I lived with my wife on a farm. We bought 43 acres. I read too much Tolstoy. Levin, I think I got caught up. And I got married in a peasant shirt. And we left the church. My wife and I got 43 acres. And I got a cow and some pigs and some chickens. And we had three kids. And I was working in a warehouse. And oh, I didn't know what I was doing. But I read a friend of mine gave me Orthodoxy years ago. My first teacher from Sterling, Colorado, gave me a copy of Orthodoxy. And I started reading it. Anyway, I found out that I'd taken some education course and I didn't make those, I didn't like them. So I went over and got in the philosophy department. I didn't get in the right times. So I didn't go with the official entry, but they let me in midstream, so I took some courses. And they found out after a year or so, uh, they, let me be, uh, they let me in. And then it took them four years before they let me teach because I, I started reading Chester and I would argue. And it was all Marxist I was with. And they wouldn't let me teach for four years and I got to teach a little. And uh, anyway, but I had to go teach the... Uh, the uh, G, what is it, the a GRE or that the exam you got to take? And I went and take it. I hadn't taken it for my records. And I was in there about five minutes later. I had some work to do on a farm. I did about five minutes. I said, what the hell am I doing? I got up and I left. <laughs> Two hours in the exam. I don't know. I never heard the score, but I'm sure I got the lowest score ever on a GRE. Father John Barth went on to Boston College. was my uh, English teacher from whom I read scripture with. And he showed me with Chesterton was once this old English professor, dignified man. I was walking down the hall and said, Chesterton says you have to have one foot in this world and another in the next. What should you do? And right there, and he looked at me and he said, turned around, stood like this and grabbed his ankles and looked at the ceiling. He said, Tom, do this. And I humbly tried to do it. And he said, that's what it looks like. In a hall full of people. <laughs> Chaplain. Father, he went on to become the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences with Bob Barr. I was on academic probation all through graduate school. I got a little more minutes. I got a couple more little things I got to say. <laughs> I, I argued with all my classes with Marxism, and I'm studying Marxism all the time. And I asked some of these fellows, I go, my brother-in-law, David, God bless him, brother's here. He has a farm right beside him. And my wife met him, met, came to visit us, met him, and I got married. I've been married for over 30 years, and I've got wonderful kids. But the Marxist kids I work with, I said, we're bucking some bales tonight, you know, five, six hundred. I need some help. Could you come down and help me? Oh, well, uh, 
I'm allergic to ticks and chickers. And I said, hey, there'll be horse flies too. <laughs> so they couldn't come. And so we went out there in Buck Bales that night, and we finished, and you're hot, and we got it done about 11. It's weather like this in Missouri, and we did it. And we're all hot and sweaty, and wear your bibs. And the secret is you don't wear underwear because the chiggers are good, but you get your bibs one button. But Buck Bales, and you come back, I'm a strong kid. I can pick up a bale one hand and throw it up there. They put me on a truck, I would do that. And so we went up at the end of where we finished. We went up to David's Pond. We stepped there. We looked at, we got up to the side of the water, dropped our bibs, walked right and jumped right into the water. And he had a floating dock right there, and we had a case of stag beer. You got to have it really cold before you drink it. And we stood there without our bibs on and the moonlight talking about the world and our families. <laughs> I failed at GRE. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm on academic probation. It was heaven on earth. At that moment, that's leisure. Completely lost in work. You got chiggers. I went, got up the morning, I milked my cow, I'm winky, at 4.30 in the morning, rode with my neighbor, the mailman, he dropped me off, picked me up after work, I worked out at the gym, taught, played a little basketball of 100 by ones, taught another course, got home at 5, milked the cow again, and kissed my lovely wife, because a wife is like a fire, and she kept a wonderful home all these years. Raised his kids, whoo, we burned them. <laughs> Academic probation, let me fail that exam again. <laughs> And I was, a, I was undergraduate, they had, they had 14 graduate students, and everything being mechanical and monstrous that they are, they had to evaluate all of us. First thing I did when they gave me the class, here's the textbook you used, Tom. I walked over to the bookstore, canceled the textbook, ordered Plato's Five Dialogue, a few other books like that. They had all the rankings, 28 rankings, Tom Martin, one and two, for all the TAs. I had no idea what I'm doing. I never had a lecture in my life. I never had a PowerPoint in my life at all. And I'll close with a great American, Frederick Douglass, who was not allowed to read. And he learned to read somehow by a kind woman. The slave master found out and told her, don't let him read. And she turned into a vampire. But he learned to read enough. And he started playing with other children. And he was watching their books and how they're doing things. And he figured out how to read. And he got something called, I might be wrong, the Columbia Orator. So he's an Irishman. He heard somebody gave him this book. And in that was some of Plato, the Crito, things like this. And there were lines like, why do you care about wealth, reputation, and honor so much, and so little about your soul? And he realized at that moment, when he looked at his slaves, these are brothers, that he wished he was back with them because they didn't realize how bad it was. But he heard the sweet sounds of liberty, and there was no way of going back. God bless America. Let me finish with He's got his ending. I begin this long, conclude with his ever so hazy outline of so great and majestic matter as the American democracy, democratic experience without testifying my belief that this is also the same ad, ad, ultimate test will come. So far as democracy becomes or remains Catholic and Christian, that democracy will remain, that, that democracy will remain democratic. And so far as this is not, it will become wild and wickedly undemocratic. Its rich will riot with a brutal indifference far beyond the feudal, feeble feudalism which retains some shadow of responsibility or lack of patronage. Its wage slaves will either sink into heathen slavery or seek relief in theories that are destructive, not merely in method, but also in aim, since they are but negations of the human appetites of property and personality, character. 18th century ideals formulating 18th century language lack no longer themselves how the whole back the pagan passions. You are America, the hope of America. You are in a revolution. God bless America.
There's some great stuff about Solzhenitsyn there. That was... I'm not finished. I'm not finished. That was really good. We learned it off from Chester. It was great. I failed again. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't realize when we invited him to speak that he failed the GRE. I mean, that was... <laughs> Nonetheless, I have a box here. I'm going to take the contents of the box out of the box. Because inside this box is the Lifetime Achievement Award for the Chester Society. There it is, Tom. God bless you. Oh, no. All right. There it is. All right. Great. All right. Okay.